Matthew chapter number 7. Verses number 1 through 5 is our text. And my message is entitled, What Would Jesus Do About Being Judgmental? Now, if you're that kind of a, of a person, you probably won't enjoy the message today. Matthew chapter number 7, look at verse number 1 through 5, and Jesus is speaking. Jesus said, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the, the moat, that, that speck of, of, of dust in thy brother's eye? But considerest not the beam, that two by four, that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the moat, out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Father, help us today to see yet this another aspect of what would Jesus do, and particularly about the judgmental attitude that humanity, uh, that so many, many of us uh, are, are prone to have. God, help us see that it displeases you, and help us, uh, Lord, to uh, come to grips with the message of this text that you're giving us as individuals. And, Lord, uh, some are here, uh, they don't have the sweet assurance that if they died uh, suddenly today, they would go into heaven. Some of them, Lord, are relying on their good works or their morality or uh, their family structure or, or even some religion, but they've never, ever really uh, come to grips with the need that they have, that they are a sinner and they need forgiveness and they need to own Christ as Savior. Help them, Lord, to do that today and help us, uh, Lord, to be what you would like for us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I do hope that you're not getting tired of Every Sunday, having Pastor Rains confront you with the challenge, what would Jesus do? No matter what situation life finds me in, that, that pastor gives me this challenge, what would Jesus do? I, I hope you're not getting tired of being asked, would you be willing to do what Jesus did? Would you strive to follow our Lord's admonitions? Would you strive uh, to teach your children, uh, your family, your circle of friends to follow Jesus? and what he says we must do in life. Here's my guiding thoughts for the message today. First of all, you can't help but see Jesus prohibits a judgmental attitude. Just clearly prohibits it. We'll see also that 
Jesus wants us to see our own personal problems. Not so much look at my uh, neighbor or the one that works with me or the one that sits close to me in church, but look in the mirror and see my own personal problems. And Jesus will see that he calls us to action, calls us to action. But have you thought about a, a judgmental attitude? I've been so familiar with it most of my life. And I repent uh, before God to say that I've often had one. But Jesus clearly prohibits a judgmental attitude. And God knows my heart. I've really striven over the years to, to, to get away from that, to not have that not allow it to be a part of my Christian walk. Look at the text. Jesus makes a very plain statement, doesn't he? In verse number one, he said to his audience, judge not that you be not judged. Now, what do you think is involved in that command? Well, First of all, I want you to consider what he is not saying. You see, sometimes people uh, th that don't uh, have a proper understanding of Scripture in its whole, they, they, they have a wrong view of, of this passage. Uh, let me tell you what he's not is saying what's not involved in this command. Uh, he is not saying that we can't know what's right and wrong. He is not saying that we cannot know what is sin and what is not sin. He is not saying that we cannot know what God condemns and what he doesn't condemn. He's not saying that. You know why he's not saying that? Because the Bible, the very word of God itself, tells us clearly what sin is and clearly tells us what's wrong and clearly tells us what God condemns. We can know right from wrong. So, we absolutely are to make judgments as to what is wrong. Uh, uh, and this is important to understand because we live in a society and uh, we live in a day and amongst a people that if perchance you, you, you uh, uh, denounce some sin that they're guilty of, they'll, they'll begin to say, oh, you can't be judging me, he's judging me, or that church is judging me, or you can't judge me. Just kind of makes you, if you know the Bible, kind of makes you sick that, that people don't know no better as to think just because you're uh, denouncing a sin that you're judging them a, a, as a person. There is a difference, my friend. But what do you think about the commandments? Exodus chapter 20. All ten of them, the first 
Four is our relationship with God and the remaining six is man's relationship with man and I don't have to recite the Ten Commandments to you. You already know what they are. In fact, God has written them in an unseen way with an iron of pen upon the very conscience and soul of man instinctively you know about the Ten Commandments. So I don't have to go through them all. There's that fella. He's committed murder. And the law of the land, he's apprehended. He sits in the courtroom. And uh, his crime is, is announced. Now, now uh, that, that judge, uh, how do you, what do you think it would be if, if that, that, that murderer said, Judge, you can't judge me. <laughs> you can't judge me. You're judging me, Judge. Obviously, we are given the ability to know what's right and wrong and judge the same. If you go farther in the passage, down into uh, verses uh, uh, a a little later, I think in verse 20, Jesus said, by people's fruits you know them. In other words, it's not judging the soul, it's judging the deeds. It's having a scripture sense enough to know what's right and wrong. <laughs> uh, I, I'm just, this, this just jumps in my mind, so it might, uh, might help you. Might, 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 might offend you, I don't know. But... A friend of mine uh, <laughs> sent me a post, and uh, <laughs> and these uh, uh, perverts, uh, sexual perverts, uh, men, women, men dressed up like men, or women and women dressed up like men. Vile looks, vile deeds, vile actions, protesting, walking down the streets. <laughs> and this caption You can't judge me. God only is my judge. And then there's another caption put at the top. And there's a voice from heaven, and God speaks and looks down and says, You're a pervert! <laughs> I, I like that because, you see, God is the one that tells us what's right and what's wrong. God calls a spade a spade, an ace an ace, a right a right, and a wrong a wrong. So we can know. So if people get their feelings hurt... Bless their little hearts. Is the only thing I know to say. But let's look at what he is saying in the text. He is prohibiting a judgmental attitude in our life. After reading the text, it makes this very clear. Look at verse number 5. Thou hypocrite. You see, a hypocrite is someone that professes to be something they know they are not. A a hypocrite is uh, someone that makes allowances for their own sins while condemning uh, the different kinds of sins in someone else's life. So God is addressing the attitude and he's prohibiting a judgmental attitude. 
Uh, John chapter 8 tells us a story that illustrates it. These religious people, and if you have much understanding of the of the thing, it, it looks like it's a whole, uh, it's a totally set up situation. As a matter of fact, uh, the Pharisees uh, probably uh, chose the man that went into the tent with the woman for the purpose uh, of catching them in the act. You've heard the story. Those religious people. I'm so pious. I'm so godly. I go to the synagogue. I got these scripture verses in this pouch on my forehead. You can tell by this robe that I wear that I'm righteous. And they went down there. I opened the motel room. And, and they caught a woman in the act of adultery with a man. And they, well, but Moses said, we ought to stone you. So they dragged that, that dear lady out of that motel room and dragged her publicly through the streets. But it's interesting. Where was the man? It didn't say anything about them getting the man. Not, not a word. That sorry rat, he scurried back in the crowd of the religiosity bunch is what he done. That he had helped them and their ill uh, gotten venture and took that lady flung her down on the road and said to Jesus well Moses said we ought to stone this woman taken in adultery but what sayest thou and you've heard the story Jesus was quiet a moment and then he knelt down on the sand and Perhaps with his finger, it, with his finger, he he scribbled some words in the dirt, and it isn't said what he said, but the eyes uh, of, of the hypocrites, of the of the judgmental attitudes, were upon the ground, and then Jesus turned. To them and said, You that are without sin, cast the first stone at this woman. There was a hush fell over the crowd that day as the Holy Ghost of God penetrated every heart with a solemn truth. That one sinner has little business having a judgmental attitude and plotting judgmental action against his fellow man who is like he, a sinner also. And they begin to drop their stone, scurry away. And Jesus said, Looked around and said, Woman, where are thine accusers? Uh, listen, Jesus forbids a judgmental attitude. You read a little further in John chapter 8, and there's some people so plagued with a judgmental attitude that Jesus, when he was preaching, they looked at themselves. As religious people say, I don't need this message. I don't need nobody telling me I'm a sinner. I don't need nobody uh, telling me that, that that I need something more than the righteousness of the law. I, I don't need this kind of 
preaching, uh, particularly, uh, and, and I'm just going to tell him right up in the face of Jesus and say, look, buddy, we're not born of fornication like you are. In other words, because they didn't understand the concept of the virgin birth of Christ, they accused him of being a bastard. to an ordinary man in the community. Listen, God forbids a judgmental attitude. You can know what's right and wrong. You can call a spade a spade. But you better watch that attitude while you're doing it. Because you may be walking on ground where angels fear to trot. Judgmental attitude. I've seen a lot of it over the years. And may I tell you, as a pastor, I've seen a lot of it. And every time I've seen it, may I just tell you, I've known the people uh, that had it well enough to know their problem in a lot of ways, spiritually speaking, uh, attitude-wise, was worse than that of the sinner. I'm not getting too many amens today. I wonder why. I went out to... I got some quarters in, in my office. I'm going to bring them out here and start flipping for quarters. If I flip you a quarter, will you give me an amen? Amen. Listen, Jesus wants us to see our own problems. Look at chapter 7, verse number 3. Let me go through that quickly for you. Verse number 3. Jesus wants to see our, us to see our own problems. And notice, I want you to see special emphasis upon these statements in verse 3. Look at verse 3 without reading the whole uh, verse. Read this. But considers not the beam that is in thine own eye. <laughs> yeah. Jesus said, yeah, I, I know that. That other fellow's got some problems. I, I know that. Hey, but I know you got some problems too. I know in your heart, I know in your mind, I know in your old stinky, ungodly attitude, you, you got a two by four, and the person you're judging's only got a speck. Uh, that's something there. God don't always see things the way we do. Some little speck of something that we, we think's big, 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 big. God sees a two before in our own life. It's a lot bigger than that. Look, look at verse 4. Behold, the beam was in thine own eye. Look at verse number 5. First, cast out the beam out of thine own eye. <laughs> thine own eye. Thine own eye. Thine own eye. Jesus wants us to see our personal problems. Now, I'm going to take you just now to a portion of Scripture you're probably not even going to like. You won't know what to do with it. It'll make you feel bad. You might even go out here and say... I left services feeling bad today. I ain't going to go back to that church because that preacher made me feel bad. Uh, Romans chapter number 3, verses number 21 through 24. You see, Jesus wants us to understand and acknowledge our own uh, sin problems. Now let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Let, 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 let me call you all a name. You all are sinners. Even the fellow in the pulpit. Look at Romans chapter number 3. Jesus wants us to understand and acknowledge 
our own problems. Here's what God says about a judgmental attitude. Romans chapter number 3, uh, verse number uh, 21. No, Romans chapter 2, verse number 21. I, I wrote, I'm, I'm such a sinner, I, I meant to write 2 down and I wrote 3 down. Instead, look at verse 21. Therefore thou which teachest another, teachest not thou thyself. And thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal. So listen, he's talking to the preacher, and he's talking to the teacher, and he's talking to the churchgoer, and he's talking to everybody. Dost thou steal? You say somebody shouldn't steal. Well, preacher, I don't steal. I don't, are you sure about that? I mean, are you really sure you don't steal? I think I'd be absolutely right if I made this statement and said every one of us in this auditorium steals. I'm mad at him now. I ain't ever stolen anything. Well, let me ask you a couple of questions. Before you say no, what about your time that God claims part of? Huh? I mean, the word, the word of God to make clear there's a certain amount of your time that he gives you that he demands for him. And you know what people do? They steal the time that belongs to God and they use it for themselves how they want to. But I ain't no thief. I never stole a watermelon in my life. That's all right. I've stolen enough watermelon for everybody in this auditorium. Where I grew up, that was pastime. It was wrong. But I never stole nothing. You sure about that? You sure about that, you see? Well, well, some of you people got some good talents. Where do you use them? God give you them talents. What are you doing with the talents God's given you? Some of you people use your talents in the world. Here, there, and everywhere. Oh, 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 they, they belong in the house of God. And let me tell you something. If you've got talents that God's blessed you with and you aren't giving them to God, you're a thief. You've stolen the talents he wants you to use for him and you've used them for the flesh and the world and the devil. Nah. You know what to call this? Bible preaching. Uh, listen, what about Malachi 3, 8? You've robbed me, God said to Israelite. And those old Jews said, oh, we, ain't, we, we haven't stolen. We're, we're in them. We robbed you. He said, you didn't pay your tithe. Have you stolen? Read it. By Malachi chapter 3, verse number. You stole what belongs to God. So, Thou the priest as a man should not steal, thus thou steal. Look at verse number two. Or, or not verse number two, but point number two uh, under this verse. Uh, look, look, look at the text. Thou that sayest the man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that arborest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Now, have a uh, listen. There's that woman. There's that man with her. <laughs> how, how, have we or do we commit adultery? Now, most people will line up in the no line. Uh, and uh, nobody. But where would you stand 
when Jesus said, it's a heart matter also. What line would you stand in? Now, I'm talking right now just for a minute to the most holy among you. <laughs> the most holy among you. The best Christians among us. A hundredfold Christians among us. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and 28. Jesus said, you've heard it said of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I've got a new twist on that old message. <laughs> Jesus said, I want you to understand how he that looks on a woman to lust after her, or, or, or she that looks on a man to lust. You see, men and women both are guilty of that. A lust after him has committed adultery already in his heart. Now, which line do we stand in? Can I tell you what you all are? You all are a bunch of adulterers. Starting with the fellow in the pulpit. Now, don't frown at me. You know you are. You, you just never heard a fellow be willing to preach it like I do. That's all we are to it. We're used to in this day somebody soft pedal something, rose pedal something around, pat everybody on the head and give them a little sermonette and send them home as good little Christianettes. But we, the Lord wants us to see our own problems. The Lord wants us to see our own own problems. Listen, let me let me let me let me. Uh, now I've, got, I've knocked you down. Let me walk on you. <laughs> I, I shouldn't put it that way. I, let, I, I, now I've, I've, I've knocked. A, I, I, I've, I've knocked us all down. <laughs> let, let me kick us. <clears throat> In Romans chapter number three, chapter number two. Excuse me. I'm still hung up on three, two. Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Now, uh, dost thou commit sacrilege? You, you, you may abhor, that means to look with disgust upon uh, that native in a distant land that worship an idol. Or the old Indian that bowed before the totem pole and all the idolatrous worship in the world. We look with disgust up upon that. But are we guilty of idolatry? You know what idolatry is? Idolatry is summed up like this. Anything you put before God is idolatry. Anything you put before God is idolatry. Dost thou commit sacrilege? You know what that word sacrilege is? That means do you take that which is holy, that which is sacred, and make it profane or make it common or make it of no spiritual matter, of no spiritual consequence? Do you just profane it, bring it way down? Here, that which is holy, that which is sacred. Well, let me ask you something. I won't spend much time here. How do you treat the Lord's Day? Huh? How do you treat the Lord's Day? How you, you know, some of us, we treat it just like it's a regular common old Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Sunday's just like them. No, it isn't. Well, we'll just do on Sunday what we should do on Monday. You know, some of you disregard the holy day of God, the Lord's day so much that you're lucky to make it twice or three times a year.
you got so many excuses and buts, you're just one big butt. I want you to understand, dost thou commit sacrilege? Listen, the Lord's Day is a holy day. Listen, these songs we sing are holy songs. The worship we do is holy worship. We're on holy ground. Dost thou, that judgest everybody else, commit sacrilege? I think we're already getting the message today. Judge not. Uh, what would Jesus do about a hypocritical attitude? Well, I got to close somewhere. Uh, I think I made y'all mad at me today. I think I have. I swear, I think I have. I hope I haven't. But I really don't care. No, I really do. I really do care. I wouldn't hurt you for anything. But I care enough about you to tell you what the Bible says. Jesus would call us to personal action. It won't take me but five minutes to bring the message to close today. Let me tell you a little story. Uh, I hope you never do what my wife did one time in her life. But she was a kid. They didn't go to junior church in them days. And she was fidgeting around, and the sermon got a little long, and she was ready to get out of here, and she was trying to tell her mom, and Virgie said, shh, just as soon as he hushes, we'll leave. And Faye said, hush! <laughs> so I hope you don't tell me to hush like she did the preacher. The Lord my whoop her for telling the preacher to hush. Will you right now? But she really did do that. God calls us to personal action. Look at the thing once more. Verse 5, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. Then shalt thou clearly, see clearly, uh, you know, to, to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. Now here's what we need to understand. Jesus calls us to personal action. Our part is to look to Jesus. Our part is is to lay aside the sin that doth easily beset us. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Does anybody have any sins that easily besets them? Huh? Do you? I mean, sins that easily besets them. I got some easily besets me, but I ain't going to tell you what they are. It's enough that God knows them and I know them. But have you got any sins that easily beset you? Well, let me ask you something. Let me tell you something. God wants us to have personal action and lay aside sin that easily besets us and get the beam out of our own eye and run the Christian race with patience looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. Ours is a race between me and him. I've had no time to worry about so much somebody else. I, I don't, can't correct uh, everybody else. I need to correct me what God says. Listen, when we get our own sin problems worked out, then we're in better shape to pull the moat in somebody else's eye out. But did you know this? It's not always easy to get something out of your eye, is it? How many has experienced that? If you get something in your eye, I mean, you just can't hardly get that thing out no matter what. Guys ain't shh, water hose, shh, yeah, it's stuck. Sometimes you go to the doctor. The doctor has to hold your eyelid open, you know, because you don't like to hold your own eyelid open. You know that? You know, they start to put something, yeah, I won't let you mess with my eye. You, 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 you just, your instinct is to, is to keep that splinter in there, isn't it? Just, just keep it in there because I don't know why I lift my eyelid up. Uh, listen, doctor got to pry that thing open. 
pull that thing out. Squirt some medicine in it. Hope you'll get better. But listen, it's hard sometimes to get something out of your own eye, isn't it? That's what I want to tell you. So it's a hard job getting get stuff out of your own eye. And sometimes you think you got out of your own eye and then you find out later you didn't get out of your eye. An eyelash is like that, isn't it? I mean, you think you got it out, but you find a little later you didn't get it out. So my message is simply this. Even if you think you got your life in all, all in order, don't jump on the judgment wagon to judge somebody else. Give it a little while. See if that thing really took with you. Because chances are you still got something in your eye. Amen. And let me tell you this. Even if you did get it out of your eye, you'll get something else in your eye before it's over with. How many times you had stuff in your eye over the years? So you see the message God is saying, just, just keep your own eye clean and, and let God take care of, of, of everything else. You know what? Our job is to just tell it like it is, be honest and truthful, and, uh, and, and love, uh, denounce sin while we love the sinner and to keep a good attitude. What would Jesus do about a judgmental attitude? Well, listen, uh, we've learned what he would do about a judgmental attitude today. So the question is, will you let him prohibit it? Will you mind him? Will you lay it aside? Will you determine I'm not gonna I'm not gonna have this old judgmental attitude I've been carrying around. I'm not gonna have that. Lay it at the altar. I'm gonna take care of my own problems. I'm gonna arise to personal action. Let's stand.